the researcher had argued that Laleshwari, Ma Laleshwari is an exponent of Islamic thought. Now, this is the farthest from truth. And why do I say so? I say so because truth is infinite. When you express truth, the very expression is a finite, is an attempt in translating something infinite into a finite thing. And when a mystic of the order of Laleshwari expresses herself in poetry, she encompasses the infinity that she has experienced in her poetry with the help of mystic symbolism. Now, every person who approaches such a poetry finds something or the other endorse his or her preconceived notions and therefore reads into the poetry the thought patterns that he or the belief patterns that he or she belongs to. Now this is something as a student of literature I believe the greatest intellectual heresy that can be committed. Because when we assess any work of art, be it even a mystical work, we need to see it in its totality. We cannot look at one aspect to the exclusion of all other aspects. This is one injury that is done to her message. Then there is the other tradition of the, the scholastic tradition of the West, which is embedded in the Enlightenment philosophy, which sees every expression as an expression of the rational mind. Now, rationality, I do not deny and should not be denied, even in one of the Rigvedic hymns as translated in The Secret of Vedic by Sri Aurobindo, there is a colloquy between Maharishi Agastya and Indra. Indra as Sri Aurobindo explains, is the lord of luminous or pure intelligence. And in this colloquy, Indra very clearly tells Augusta that do not try to bypass me because you will have to go through me if you have to move ahead on the spiritual path. So rationality has a scope, nobody denies it, but then rationality has its limitations. Now what is that limitation that rationality imposes on the perception of truth? When we speak of the perception of truth, there are two aspects. Most often the truth that we refer to is the one which is perceived by the senses or perceived by senses which seek to overcome the limitations of the senses, something that science tries to do. But despite that, despite the extension of the senses with the finest of scientific instruments, 
the truth that is comprehended the truth that is apprehended continues to be within the domain of matter and within the domain of sense reality and because of this it has a limitation now when the mystic speaks of gods and goddesses and when the mystic speaks of his spiritual practices or her religious spiritual practices the mystic seeks to do the same thing as the scientist seeks to do both are in search of the truth but for the scientist for the rationalist the equipment the tool is rationality is reason and reason has a limited domain but for the mystic the tool is intuition because the mystic is standing rather stands on the diving board and seeks to jump off the diving board of material reality into a domain which is totally unknown uncharted because it is the domain of energy and here reason flounders reason fumbles this is the reason can at the best arrive at conceptualizations generalizations but all these are derivations based on empirical observation of facts physical facts you do not go beyond the physical consciousness here i would like to again bring in a mention of sri aurobindo who very clearly says that in the course of creative evolution of nature man is not the last chapter man is definitely an important chapter because he or she has been gifted with intelligence the ability to sift truth from falsehood but to perceive directly the truth he or she needs to develop intel intuition the faculty of intuition now what is this faculty of intuition it is this faculty which enables the vedic seers the vedic rishis to apprehend and comprehend the truth and having understood it it's not just it's not a mental understanding it is a direct perception just as i see with my senses i see with my intuition the real truth and in the case of the rationalist it is always a derivation always a generalization subject to difference of opinion that is why mystics world over arrive at common truths yes they will be mediated through the cultural expressions of the cultures to which they belong but the ultimate essence the quintessence remains the same and this is exactly that we find in laleshwari so when we try to understand nandev's poetry we should not forget that she is not an intellectual who will be influenced by ideas here and there she is an individual seeker of truth who has 
abandoned the outside world and peeped inside, gone inside. And once she has gone in, she is discovering the truth from within. Her own self is the laboratory. And it is in this laboratory she is discovering the truth, not just of the self, but also of the world, because the self and the world are one. So, to find out, to place Laleshuri in a certain tradition and say that she was influenced by such and such person, no, they do not. Laleshuri is not a philosopher. She is a mistake. She is a person who has perceived truth directly. So based on her perceptions, then she speaks. It is for the intellectuals later on to understand and decode what she has experienced. And at times, the mystic himself or herself has to after he or she has come out of the samadhi, has come out of that spiritual experience, he or she has to understand the experience. This is exactly what happened to me when I read Naleshwari to, to three experiences of mine which had not been clarified to me, got clarified. So we need to understand the person who is expressing herself. Nandan is a mystic poet and we need to understand that she uses, she is going beyond the ken, beyond the reach of the human mind. And when she is going beyond the reach of the human mind, now try to understand when a person of this kind, like even tries to express a truth that she has experienced, she finds it difficult to locate, to get the kind of language that would explain what she wants to say. The Vedic seers did it with the help of the formulaic symbols that they used in the Rig Ved. Naleshwari creates her own from everyday life of the common Kashmiri living in the 14th century. So when she refers to water, it is not the same water that we see, the physical water. It's a different water. The terms use, the references use, the reference are different, the terms are the same in mystic poetry and to impose meanings is dangerous. The third thing that I would like to say which is very unique to Kashmir Shaivism and here Kashmir Shaivism scores over every philosophy in the world. It speaks of spandan, the vibration. And that is the truth of existence. When we embed her, her poetry is a spandan. Her poetry is a vibration emerging out of truth, consciousness. So if one walks to or wants to transform one's mental consciousness, or what we say, Chetanaka Rupantaran, wants to transform one's mental consciousness into truth consciousness, one has to give up this clinging on to meaning making, the process of meaning making. The process of meaning making is a rational exercise. The mother of Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Mira Alfansa, used to say that when you read poetry of such a kind, do not try to mentalize. Then the disciples asked, then what should be the approach? 
she said resonate with the rhythm of the lines when you let the these are mantras as nuns would say goram dopnam nepratha andaratsun suigom suigom lale vaastu vatsun it's a mantra these are mantras and when you try to when you encounter mantras the tendency the problem with us is that we have been cast in the western paradigm of intellectuality we need to get out of that because that is just a part of it that's just the tip of the iceberg of reality so if we want to comprehend reality in its entirety in its infinity we need to transcend that limitation i'm not saying that we should abandon it but what i'm saying is that we need to realize its limitations and so when you experience this poetry you need to understand its lie its rhythm the moment you resonate with that rhythm because ultimately we all as individuals are born out of vibrations we are born out of sound vibrations remember the first word we say nad brahma and we say it came out the vibrations everything is born out of the sound o it's not that other scriptures don't speak of in the book of genesis in matthew it there's a mention in the beginning was the word and the word was god and the word was with god i hope i'm not misphrasing it but such a concerted kind of interpretation which we find here in india you do find elsewhere the addressing of the fundamentals that is the beauty so the third thing that we need to realize if we want to get into the spirit of this poetry and we work because ultimately the purpose of all human life is to evolve and the evolution has to be from the ordinary sensory mind reality to the intuitive truth conscious reality we have to transform our consciousness knowledge jnan these are all secondary these are by products of intellectual activity we need to go step beyond it it's a stepping into the void and that is where experience becomes very important in the case of laleshwari the reference to the void the reference kernas manzar kehta hu grav out of nothing something came out the problem with human mind is we immediately try to build a system out of a small statement out of some statements that we find corroborating our mindsets so the see a reference to nothingness to shunya you will immediately jump to the conclusion that nam raleshwari is not even islamic she is buddhist we are in the habit of creating isms we are in the habit of creating paradigms the problem with all intellectual systems and paradigms is that these are vulnerable and reminded of a statement made once by one of the famous american poets who says a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of a little mind and this is exactly what most intellectuals indulge in they seek to create systems they seek to create paradigms now truth defies all paradigms because truth is multifarious it is as somebody has said representative of the creative chaos 
And possibly that is why one postmodernist historian had a trouble when she tried to write a book on Hinduism. The book was pulp because even she failed to understand this. The title page was highly derogatory. So these are the things that we need to bear in mind when we approach. So the perception should not be a mental one. Because the moment you try to understand the sound, that's why I say many times it is phonetics is higher than semantics. It's a higher activity, form of activity than semantics. Semantics is the science of meaning making and phonetics is the science of sounds. Sound is higher than. I think we need to step out of it because it is this that all these mystic poets are inspiring us to do. Now, when I went through this, her poetry, I found a reference to most of the stages that a mystic goes through. In his journey or her journey of spiritual transformation, usually beginning with the Buddhist, Buddhistic negation of the sense reality, where you see inversion of values, where you see lack of order, and there are rocks which very beautifully reach out to the human mind. Gatala vichu ak vichu, but what you say to Maran? Pans and Haran, Pans and Haran, Pohne Vavla, Neshbur ak vichu, Vajas Maran, Pananan, Dupraran, Chenim, Nupra. I'm sorry, I have difficulty in reading the Roman, the Kashmiri and Roman script. It's very difficult to make out the exact word written over there. But having gone through this, I have. So here we have a reality which is presented of an educated person dying of hunger. And on the other hand, a person who is unlettered, foolish, beating his cook. Why? Because he has the power. So learning has no value in this world. Scholarship has no value. And you see it all around you. The teacher has lost his value in the modern Indian society. Because had the teacher been valued, the society would not have gone down here. Any community which disrespects its teachers has to go down. I will not go into too many details, but I would like to definitely, the second thing that she speaks of is the need to be moderate. When you are, have turned your attention, because when you realize that this world is not something to be lived for, and let me tell you, every mistake has gone through this experience. I had one year of spiritual tradition when I was 20 years old, and I used to feel that I would die. But one year, I would visit doctors, and there used to be one Dr. T. and Bhatt in Jammu, and he would say, it's a chuk philosopher, Banyumut. You have become a philosopher. So people will call you now a philosopher. So that was the way he, very in a very joker's manner, laughed away my problem. The world seems to be not worth cherishing and it is then at that time the guru becomes important and the guru tells her my guru asked me 
Don't you only give me one advice? Turn your attention from outside because your senses look out. So you are all the time preoccupied with sense reality. So my guru told me, turn your attention inside. And when this happened, Sriko Lalit Me That became the mantra of my spiritual practice. Now, this is again a kind of a myth which has been created around this. These are literal translations are dangerous. We need to understand that this is a highly metaphorical reference when she says that since then I have started going naked, what she basically means is that she has no regard for how she dresses up. It is not she doesn't dress up any longer now for self for showing off, for keeping in mind the world around. Because in a later verse, she very clearly advocates moderation. She says, If you keep eating, you will not reach anywhere. That is, if you are blameless, nakhan gachak ahunkari. At the same time, see, on the one hand is the Epicurean tradition that you want to become bohemian and you want to guzzle everything, all pleasures of life. You would reach nowhere. But similarly, she at the same time is critical of the other extreme that the extreme of extreme austerity is in the name of realizing truth consciousness wherein the person goes for fasting this is exactly what even the buddha experienced in his life that he went for fasting so many years and years days and days and nothing came out and then he came back and advocated the middle path so that is why she says so he kept so many kemane, so many asak. So she is advocating. So many means moderation. She is advocating moderation. And if you practice moderation, she says, the doors will open. The doors of truth consciousness will open on you and it will dawn on you. So, and at another place, yet another place, she says that dress up yourself to the extent that it can protect you from the cold. Dressing up is from cold and heat. Dressing up is not for ostentation. So the purpose clearly is that what she wants to communicate is a turning in of attention because that is what most people are turning out. They are looking out. So she says, look inside, forget what the world speaks of you. Do not be concerned about what the world will make of you, the image. It is the reality, like in marketing we say that there is a difference between image and reality, the identity and the image. She says, forget the image that the world, you are building for yourself in the world. Turn within and pay attention to the real person within you. So this is the way she is turning in. So the turning in has happened and moderation. She speaks of moderation. She speaks of the middle path. Now anybody could jump the gun and say that this is Buddhism. See, we are in the habit of imposing isms on everything. The avocation of Shunya, the avocation of middle path. So you get a fantastic philosophy. There will a new person will come and say, now this is Lal is Buddhist. You forget the fact that she was born within the Shavai tradition. And it is within that tradition that, yes, as we say, shall see later on, that she exceeded it. Yes, because there is a personal God, there is an impersonal God. So this is the beauty of Sanatan Dharu, that it speaks, it speaks of the multifaceted infinity. It does not seek to contain truth within a certain set of parameters. 
truth is infinite multi dimensional any such attempt is bound to be failure the most important thing that most mystics have to very care that is why she spoke of conceit even there you see the conceit of a good man is dangerous more dangerous than the conceit of a person who is bad who is evil the person who gives and announces that i have done good to this person good to that person that is why even guru nanak see the entire bhakti movement takes off in her way because bhakti movement starts way back later on somewhere much after this and here again you see this emphasis on the guru that is why guru nanak says that whatever in jabji sahib the beej mantra ekamkar satnam karta purkh nir bhav nirvay akal murat ajuni sabam gur prasad he says whatever i have achieved i have not achieved by dint of my personal effort whatever i achieved i achieved it by virtue of the blessing of the grace of my guru and that is exactly what lal is saying that do not create an ego of virtue because this ego head is difficult to kill this ego head is dangerous to suppress and crush and that is why she says that even if people look at you and when she says if people look at you and and make fun of you do not bother you see i am a little weak in the works in kashmiri works and narrating them because i find it difficult to read the kashmiri works in english but this is exactly what she says so she refers to a negation of the ego and then there is this another once you have so she says kill your ego yes maruk okay i will not waste your time by reading these because then i'll struggle with the reading of the kashmiri in roman script now here is the other where she another walk where she is speaking of moving from ritual to practice spiritual practice you see this is the problem religion is not bad ritual is not bad as long as you understand the meaning of the ritual but most often when people engage in ritual they engage with different motives and sometimes in a mindless way so that is why you have lines such as this divata divata prak bol chhi ek var pooj ka pooj kas karak kot bata kar manast pavnas sangha so she is asking the people actually she is not just asking the people she is also counseling herself that is the mode the interior dialogue the soliloquy that she employs and also her interface with the public by counseling herself she is counseling her own self because she is undergoing that change that transformative process of spiritual regeneration spiritual resurrection as is spoken of as the epiphany the renewal the rebirth so she has to undergo that epiphany now if she has to undergo that epiphany so this is important that she does not restrict herself to ritual she goes beyond the ritual and understands the real significance and there is another reason for that these practices the spiritual practices these are shortcuts these are shortcuts to transformation yes now this is the point once she she narrates the 
experience of the mystic who has got disillusioned with reality, who has espoused moderation, moderation not just in terms of physical cravings and physical desires, but also in terms of the desires that afflict the mind. Calm, crude, no more. There is another work on that. So that the mind is totally put in the mental equipoise. It attains an, a sense of equipoise. Now, when that happens, what is triggered? And this I call zero consciousness. What is triggered is the experience of Shun. Now, this is not an intellectual concept. If you reduce it to an intellectual co concept, I think you are the, do, doing the greatest monstrosity on the interpretation of her poetry. She's speaking of, the way it speaks of it, that every mystic, when he or she crosses physical reality into the other side, the intervening plane is the plane of Shunya. And I can say it on the basis of my own individual mystic experiences. When suddenly you are confronted with that you are not Nabhavati, you do not exist, you have that consciousness, and it is a very scary experience to begin with. Because most of the times we have been living with the orientations, the mental parameters of this reality, sense reality. This negation happens because why? Because all this world was created out of Shunya. I give an equation for this. Zero is equal to x plus minus x. Zero means Shunya gives birth to infinite pairs of duality. And, and it is always true. Any value to x, you will have infinite pairs of opposites. And this is also expressed in Guru Granth Sahib Ji, where Guru Nanak Dev Ji says, Pavan Guru Pani Pita Mata Dhat Mahat Divsarat Dui Dai Daya Khele Sagarjan. That this entire world is an interplay of opposites. And that is how this world, so that is why it is coming out of Shunya. Shunya is the one which is the anchor of this reality. But Shunya is not the last stage. As is made out in Buddhism. I'm not saying as is made out by the Buddha. I'm saying as is made out in Buddhism. Because ism is created by the followers. Religion really begins with the followers. Not with the first person. The true religion begins and ends with the first person. As long as you do not yourself move out on the spiritual journey, till then you do not realize this. So when the Buddha was asked what is beyond, he kept mum because he knew that if he were to explain what was beyond Shunya, no one would understand. So that is why the West extols Buddhism too much, because it looks rational. It's a very rational interpretation of this world. But the moment you undergo Shunya consciousness, and this Shunya consciousness, Lal explains here when she says, Baal Gol, Te Prakash Aazune, Sandar Gol, Te Mokhi Chat, Chat Gol, Te Kehte Naukune. Nothing is existing now. The three triune prakriti, triune reality, the reality of the gross physical body, the reality of pran, the vital plane, the vital as Sri Aurobindo would put it, the vital plane of existence 
and the third the mental plane of existence the plane of existence which is the thought plane plane all these three have disappeared and now the person she takes a dip in it and that is why she says here beautiful lines where she says shuk morgan kurubas she travels through this expanse of shunya na mane rozum na bad na kosh i lost all consciousness i lost all consciousness of this world vise supa vise sapnis sapnis panai panas ab kani kili fel blood pump push it is only when she crossed the plane of shunya that she confronted what we call sat chit anand param shiv such a the plane of truth consciousness which is all bliss the plane of param shiv and this is what i wanted to say that you see in a lecture of this short krishna it's very difficult to do justice to the to the institution i would say not an individual to the institution of nandev she is an institution in her own right because every mistake the encounter with every mistake is a multi layered experience the first time you experience one thing the second time you go you experience another thing so every time you are dipping into this it is the best tirth the best pilgrimage that one can undertake so this is what i wanted to say that she is very much within the sham tradition she within the sham tradition she moves from the rejection of the world as it is but she does not say that you indulge in extreme practices even in the name of spirituality she advises moderation and she advises the killing of the ego because ego is one thing it is a knot which stands in the way of because what is ego ego is your little self it is like the little self cannot contain the greater self the little self the subset has to become a part of the universal self so if the subset has to become a part of the universal self it has to surrender it and that unconditionally so the beauty of lalit's poetry is mystic the images that she takes from the common man's life she is not a scholar she is not a philosopher but she is definitely a seeker of truth and she arrives at that truth consciousness which is infinite now to put such a person within the paradigms and say that she is belongs to this she belongs to that i think it would be grave injustice because she represents truth consciousness and truth consciousness is much about everything and truth consciousness has only one religion and that is that religion of dharma thank you very much for bearing with me any questions you have Apologies, I was just waiting for Veronica to close. Um, oh, here she is. I'll just um, let her come and um, say her thanks and close the meeting. Uh, but that speech was incredibly inspiring. I love how you um, you coloured the whole thing with your own spiritual experiences, and you made it make sense for us through your lived um, worldview, not just some academic uh, dry analysis so i'll hand you over to veronica now please unmute yourself veronica 
that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just spotlight uh, you. Thank you, uh, Ravi Dharji. Thank you uh, on behalf of entire team Laldeth. We are grateful that you could be with us today and share so much about uh, Mata Laleshwari and from the both scientific and spiritual point of view. Thank you, thank you for being with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Dharji is a very renowned uh, researcher. He has uh, published and presented many papers uh, in the areas of modern English novel, communication policy and human rights and development studies. It was wonderful to listen to you. Thank you, thank you once again, Ravi Dharji. So uh, before we conclude our session, I would like to give a small brief about this entire initiative. So uh, this uh, is for the very first time that we are celebrating Lal Jayanti and hence it becomes essential uh, that we talk about the purpose behind this. We have received a very positive response on Facebook, WhatsApp, and other social media platforms. And uh, this, this drives us to work even harder towards the cause and even more dedicatedly work towards this, this beautiful cause. Uh, this, this is an effort towards making Lull's teachings reach out to the entire humanity across the globe. Uh, the team Lalted uh, uh, is, is uh, trying and, and uh, doing an extensive research from last two years in comprehending, assimilating, and trying to implement the works into practical aspects of life. We have read and referred to various books available uh, on the subject written by many scholars. And what we are, we are trying to reach to a very simpler conclusion. Uh, this project is still halfway through and we, we hope to conclude it uh, by early next year. Uh, Lal is not just a name. Lal is a symbol of motherhood. She, is, uh, she epitomizes uh, the best of Shiv Sadhana, Trika Sadhana. Her vax, uh, when we read, it gives an expression of her persona, her character. It gives a sense of her struggles that she faced in her life to reach to that ecstasy. And we hope that this legacy of lull continues and keep inspiring the generations to come. Uh, with that, I would uh, like to recite few parks of uh, Laldev before I we end the session. Ayas kaime dish te kaime vate gatsa kam vate kwazan vat ante dai legi me tate chum tsaris focus konsteno sat I will elaborate on, on these works a little bit. This is a, this is a collective effort of the team that uh, we have reached to this conclusion. So uh, from the work, what she means is from which direction did I come and which road did I take? Which direction shall I go? How will I know the path? Right guidance will come to my aid. Only breathing discipline will lead me nowhere. Very, very beautiful work. I will, I will read out one more. Hachiv harinj pechiv kan gom abak chan pyom yath razdane mans bag bazaras kuluf roswan gom tirat rospan gom kus malizane I had a wooden bow, my arrow turned into grass. For sculpting myself, I got an unskilled carpenter. I got exposed like an unlocked shop in the middle of the market. And now there is nothing left in the shop. My journey has become 
bereft of spiritual gains oh dear who will understand this state of mind dob ye lichavnas dob kai ni pyathe saz the saban matsnam yate sat sele firnam hani hani kaate ad lale me pravam param gat very very beautiful this is this is uh, one of my favorite box a uh, washer man dashed me on the slab rubbed me with soap and washing soda after i became thoroughly clean the tailor slowly turned scissors on me to take out super plus stuff of me then i lala attained attained the enlightenment uh that's it i would like to conclude it here thank you thank you once again to ravi darji for being with us today thank you thank you all listeners thank you very much sara